Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Susanna. I obviously gave you a particularly difficult bio, but I think that the biggest achievement of what you read out there was my name. You got that perfectly right, and it's not an easy one. Uh, I was invited here by uh, the man who's wearing the most colourful shirt in the room, um, Rick. I hadn't realised um, before this morning that most of you aren't actually geologists, so uh, thankfully it's not a particularly geology related talk, but that's the background I come from. So if you uh, have get lost with jargon and terminology, then feel free to interrupt and ask a question. Um, Give it to him with both barrels, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see if this works. Yeah, so um, obviously I'm talking to you today about um, some of the work I did at Monash University uh, before joining Anglo-American, and um, hopefully I will continue some of this from, from the industry side in a, in a different form. Uh, I'll, we'll go over an overview of the drones and sensors that are available. I, I understand there's quite a few drone users in the room. Um, then I'll do a deep dive into a particular technique known as photogrammetry, which is um, the, the science of turning digital images into 3D models. And in particular, we've been um, taking that information and applying different forms of analytics to it and trying to speed the process up by looking at how you might put it into cloud environments and then interact with sort of various types of high performance compute. And then I'll try and show you just some examples of things we've been playing with, including a fun one underground where we've got a, we, we built a drone to self auto navigate and try and build 3D models in real time and actually extract um, not just the model, but also geology and information on infrastructure uh, and degradation in an underground mine environment all in one go, which is a work in progress. A lot of these images you're seeing here are the, uh, the data sets from what Susanna was talking about. That's time spectral scanning, bird's eye view of the landscape. You can see a, a photograph in the background, and then these colors are actually represent infrared information where we can extract uh, maps of iron oxide species in that, in that case. Uh, this is the LiDAR, so it's a 3D scan of the landscape. You can see it's so accurate you can extract even the, the pylon information from that scan, as well as the, the, the ground surface through trees. This is immersive visualization. Obviously, there's goggles. In this particular case, that's a cave environment which um, various universities around the country have and um, you can walk, the advantage of these things is you can walk in as a group and you can collaboratively collaboratively interact with your three-dimensional data and we've also started thinking about how you might do analytics in that environment in a interactive way and then we started playing with, not in a very sophisticated way, we started playing with um, CNNs or deep learning techniques for creating maps and Another information, extracting other maps and other information from these data sets. And I'll go, I'll show you all those in more detail through this talk. Right, the note, Susanna mentioned the drone discovery platform, which I was involved in establishing at Monash. Um, this is only just been launched this year. The official kind of big party launch will probably take place in October. The guy who's taken over from me is Rowan Clark, so if you want to learn more about the equipment and the facilities that will be available to you, you can contact him or myself. Uh, that's my Monash address. You're welcome to email my Anglo address as well, which um, Suzanne will have a copy of. And the idea is just to bring together you know, various types of sensors, uh, platforms, and um, also start to develop the digital infrastructure side of things, which I'll explain more here. And at the same time, work closely with engineers, uh, roboticists, uh, information technology scientists to improve um, the, both the analysis, the software, and the hardware um, continuously associated with the equipment. We, um, this center was based on a large leaf that I managed to win and some Monash investment. But we've also been working closely with OSCO, which is an INCRIS facility. So those who don't know what INCRIS is, that's the national, uh, I can't remember what 
C stands for? Research. Collaborative. Collaborative, thank you. National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme. And OSCO's um, one particular platform of interest, which is for the earth sciences. Basically, there's millions of dollars through this um, facility uh, that's invested in equipment that we then use uh, in the earth sciences to do things like large seismic surveys, um, build um, <coughs> numerical modeling codes, and in my case, I've been asking, uh, put it, I put forward a proposal to them um, to really advance Australia's footprint in the, in the world of drones and sensing and digital infrastructure. So that's kind of a work in progress. And if you're interested in, in what you might be able to get from them or what I talk about today, then you, I'm sure you can actually contact OSCO directly and say that you, you, have a, you have interest in this equipment being established for your own purposes. Right, so just a quick, for those of you who aren't familiar with drones, just a quick um, infographic, if you like of uh, some typical machines. You can see that these instruments here, uh, a lot of them are off-the-shelf instruments. They're all multi-rotor, what we call multi-rotor um, drones. So you can obviously get ones that are like an aeroplane as well. Uh, but we prefer the multi-rotors because of the ability that they exhibit to fly in complicated landscapes and to do for vertical surveys as well as large, lands, long, large surface areas. There's another instrument that's the, the emerging on the market known as a VTOL, which is a vertical takeoff and landing drone, and those are a combination of multi-rotor and aircraft. They, they're very promising. They basically can, they don't need a landing strip or anything. You can, they just have the rotors embedded in their, in, their air, in their wings. They can take off vertically, and then they can fly over large surface areas as an aeroplane would for extended periods of time uh, before landing vertically again. Most of the instruments I'm showing you here, that's a Phantom, a very famous one. It's got a little uh, multi-spectral camera on it, which is used for environmental and, and agricultural surveying. Um, this is the same instrument with a digital camera, but the, the new model that's just emerged on the market um, has an RTK GPS built in it. So the images you collect from this instrument are, are, are located in space very, very accurately. These are also um, off-the-shelf instruments, a little bit more expensive. Uh, again, this one has got thermal cameras and multispectral cameras and digital cameras on. They can, those typically will fly for 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Now, that doesn't sound like a very long time. You can collect a huge amount of data in that time at very high resolution. But if you want to fly over tens of kilometers, they're not the tools for you. This one, however, is a hybrid engine multi-rotor, which uh, We've uh, taken the risk to purchase. It's actually built in Spain. It's, it's new on the market. It's called the Hybrix 2. That has all the advantages of these guys, but it will fly for four hours. So it can carry up, it can fly for a very long time. And of course, the instruments are one thing. They're kind of exciting and fun to play with. They can collect really high resolution data. But if we want to do something clever with this technology, then we have to start to link it to uh, the world of big data, data analytics, and start worrying about things like uh, storage and security and so on. So hopefully you'll get a little bit of a flavor for what we've been doing in that field. It's really very early days, um, but it, it might paint a vision of what's possible. And also a lot of this infrastructure I talk about what it is, is available to all of you. Right, so let's go down to sensors. I think the revolution in drones that's occurred over the last 10 years is actually due to miniaturization of sensors. It's not due to the fact that drones have appeared on the market. Drones have been around with us for a very long time. Churchill actually built a drone in the Second World War, which was um, a biplane um, and uh, could fly autonomously to some extent. So we've had them for a huge amount of time, but they suddenly become cheap. And the, the, the miniaturization of the digital camera has made them some, a tool that everyone wants to get their hands on. This um, slide is showing you other sensors that are, have been miniaturized that can now go on drones. There's the LiDAR that can scan, um, that, can, that does the laser scanning of landscape. That's the hyperspectral camera 
um, that can extract chemical information or biological information. I'll, I'll focus back on those in a minute. This is magnetic, aeromagnetic data. So um, what you're seeing here is an image taken from a drone flying to about 15 meters height. That's a more traditional ground mag survey. So there was a guy who walked along with a, a, a magnetometer and actually collected um, data on the ground. So we're very confident in this. This is a well-known technique. And what we've done is we've upward continued that data from the survey, from the ground survey, compared it to the drone data, and you can see that they, the comparison is, is actually very good. And the point about this is aeromagnetic techniques have been available on drones for a long time, but this is probably the first. Um, they're only just beginning to emerge onto multi-rotors. And the reason for that is people were scared that multi-rotors had too much electromagnetic uh, radiation and interference so that it would just never work. It turns out not to be the case, actually. You can, you can actually do this quite easily. It's not too hard. Other instruments that are emerging, I'm really keen on this guy. This is a gravity sensor designed. It's a, it's a very new development. It was published in Nature just two, a few years ago. That's the size of, um, I think, one centimeter wide. For those of you who know anything about gravity, um, gravity instruments on the market tend to be six to 10 kilos in weight, um, and they're very expensive. This was designed, this was inspired by your iPhone, from an accelerometer and an iPhone, it just uses a double spring. So it's now promising that we can actually build gravity meters that are relatively sensitive, uh, which will only be 500 grams in weight, total weight, once all the electronics are around. And the guys who invented this have already put it on a drone, and I happen to know that they're testing it right now um, in various environments, but it's not commercially available. Are they measuring from the air with that, or are they landing and taking off and landing? I assume that they're landing and taking off, and that's where I'd like to take it mm -hmm. in the first instance, yeah. Um, this one's a, a, an interest, interesting guy. It's, it has limited applications. You can, you can imagine a lot of applications for these. This is an L-band radiometer, and what that does is it measures soil moisture, but not just the surface, it can penetrate. So you can get moisture content down to say, well, the satellites do this, and they get moisture content down to about a meter, I think, of uh, penetration. On the drone, we think with this, with this sensor, we can get maybe a few, uh, few ten, five to 10 centimeters penetration uh, and measure the soil moisture, as well as maybe a measurement of salinity. So obviously, lots of applications to environmental and agricultural uh, fields, maybe even for things like um, tailings down if you're trying to detect leak, leakage and things like that. This will be a world first, will be the only institute uh, in the world that has such a, a sensor on board a drone, and it's being built for us at the moment, so I can't tell you if it works or not. Right. Um, right, so let's just go quickly to MAG. That's magnetometer on drone. These things have been around for, I said, for about 20 years in some form or another. Um, as I say, you can now put them onto multi rotors, and this is opening up a few possibilities. Um, for a start, we want to be able to fly these things in complicated environments, so maybe in pit environments, where you could use magnetometers on a multi-rotor instrument to actually give you some information about um, uh, the ore ahead of the, the mining phase. So it could actually help us with uh, near real-time resource updating, for instance. It, some people are thinking about using these for, um, for mapping heave and things after a blast. In the field, in terms of exploration, um, if, you can, if we can actually put the sensor on multiple machines, then you could be flying a, a, an, a, an array of, of drones through the landscape <coughs> as they detect an anomaly, a, a magnetic anomaly in the subsurface. They would then change the line spacing map out that anomaly very quickly, and then return to their broader spacing to finish off the survey, which will allow you to do um, collect data over quite large areas, but also collect really high resolution information over features of interest, which will speed up um, the typical exploration workflow. 
So there's an awful lot of delays in the exploration workflow at present because what you tend to do is you'll, you'll run a mag survey either from the air or from the ground and then air features of interest you'll have to go back and rerun that survey um, in higher resolution at a later date. And we're talking about months to years of, of work. Okay, this is just a, this slide is just an image of the LIDAR, the data that can emerge from LIDAR. We've now got LIDAR at Monash University, and again, as I say, it's available for everyone. And there's still, um, it was just received in January, February, so they're just um, commissioning the instrument and trying to make sure it's up and running. But we expect to be able to return this level of data from it very quite easily. So you, in this image I've just shown you already, you can, you can extract infrastructure information as well as landscape, as well as biomass. You can see here, this is an image of a glacial um, sheet that's flowing down a valley, and you can see the individual debris tones and moraines that are, that are um, uh, being deposited. Here's the landscape, and this is an interesting one, the bottom right is, uh, is a Mayan archaeological site, I think it's Mayan. Um, from South America, that area is covered by thick rainforest. So the LIDAR is able to penetrate through vegetation and still return information about the landscape underneath it, and to a reasonably high degree. We've mentioned the gravity already, and as, as Rick already suggested, the way that this instrument is most likely going to work um, in, the, in the near time is that the drone will have to land, take its deep, deep power or power down, take the gravity measurements, and then it will take off and uh, move to the next spot. But the advantage of putting these on a drone is that the drone itself, um, with, its, with a digital camera or with a LiDAR instrument, can actually then get a survey of the topography. And topography is a very important data set for gravity in order to do the, uh, the corrections, in order to get the actual measurement of the gravity signal that's telling you something about the Earth material beneath. Um, so there's actually an advantage of putting a gravity meter on a drone that you wouldn't get with traditional surveys. And here's that part of spectral image I showed you at the beginning. So just to remind you, the hyperspectral camera from the drone has surveyed this little patch of ground here. We've superimposed that onto an RGB image of the area. And what you're seeing here is a spectral response that's um, calibrated to look at iron oxide species. So this is actually a lignite mine in Germany. And what this image is telling you, which you cannot see in the RGB, is the different forms of acid mine drainage that are occurring in the landscape, or the reactions that are occurring in the landscape that, that, that lead to acid mine drainage, I should say. But this type of camera uh, can be used to map a whole range of, of minerals. Um, some of the iron oxides, silicates, uh, carbonates uh, to a certain extent. You can also use it to do, um, to map plant stress uh, or plant type, and it's used. It, Hyperspectral cameras used extensively in the agricultural industry, but there's no reason why you can't apply that those same sort of off-the-shelf techniques to rehabilitation sites and so on. Okay, now we're going to switch tracks and go into photogrammetry. So this is one area of drone sensing that I've spent a lot of a bit of time thinking about and, and um, supervising student projects on. What you're seeing there is a 3D image of the inside of an old volcano that collapsed. And that data set was collected just from digital photos from a drone. And the 3D model was generated using a photo, standard photogrammetric software. That Cliff face is about 300 meters high and, and maybe 400, 500 meters long. And we've we've written some code in a software package known as Cloud Compare, where you can actually begin to very rapidly uh, trace out geological boundaries and then extract their orientations and measure the spacings or thicknesses between those boundaries. So my student in this case, Sam who wrote the code and, and generated this model, then turned that information, converted that information into a, a 3D visualization package known as GoCat, where he pulled out the 3D surfaces and, and looked at how they were 
their, their, the linkages are in, occurring in three dimensional space. The photogrammetric method, for those who don't know, um, relies on what serves as a SIG algorithm to identify uh, objects or key points within overlapping photos which were taken at slightly different locations. And once you've got that information in, in three or four or more images, you can back calculate where each pixel is relative to the camera of the drone and then recalculate where the pixels are relative to each other, which is this process here, the bundle adjustment process. And, and that way you, you very quickly build up a point cloud. So the pixels are, are in 3D, three dimensional space. And once you have that, you can then use various techniques to infill the gaps. So that's a densification step. And you get basically a photorealistic three dimensional model of the thing that you're surveying. Uh, if you want, you can turn that into a wire mesh and you can put textures onto the mesh and create a really accurate model as a wire mesh as well as a, as a three dimensional point cloud. And the, the beauty of these data sets is in the earth sciences, we use them to extract things like digital elevation models and orthorectified images, which are very fundamental to our workflow. But then also, you can put them into that package I mentioned packages like Cloud Compare, and you can visualize them in 3D and then you can analyze them in 3D. And uh, software has got to the point where it's so efficient that, it's, that it's, it's, it's quite easy to steer yourself through quite high, quite large uh, files without sort of falling foul of, um, of slow processing and you know, those, those typical problems where the frames would freeze while the thing moved around and it was very frustrating. The modern day engines we've got that interact with graphical processing units are very efficient, so um, so it's quite promising. Yeah. Anyway, this is I'm just going to show you an example of applying photogrammetry to actually a fundamental science problem. So we were developing these this technology both for industry and for your sort of interesting earth science questions. In this case, you're seeing four separate photogrammetric models from uh, rock outcrops in the Sierra Nevadas in the USA. And in those outcrops, they've been glacially polished. Uh, and in those outcrops, you can see a series of, of lines which are actually dikes. And um, we were interested in mapping out those dikes in very high resolution because we want to understand how the dike um, how they intrude from what information is about their intrusion mechanisms from their shape. So the, the workflow is, is to create a model. And then within each model, you've also laid down some ground control points, which we've measured uh, with a fairly accurate RTK GPS. And you can get an, an understanding of the GPS errors, the georeferencing errors on each GPS point in that uh, landscape. And uh, very quickly, geo-reference these three-dimensional models so that the right scale and then the right orientation and then, and, then they're in, and then they're properly located in the space. And that's important because what we then do is we use um, some of the, of the code we've written in Cloud Compare to trace out the margins of the dike. And you can see these little yellow lines. They are lines where we have clicked on one end of the dike and on the other end, and it's automatically traced faithfully pixel to pixel along the margin of that dike. And you've done the same thing on the other side. And then we can pick out a middle, a midpoint, a midplane, and we can actually, because it's a three-dimensional surface, you can get the orientation on that plane. And then you can measure the spacing between each dike wall as, as shown in this schematic here. And um, so from this approach, you get orientation, you get thickness, you can get spacing between dikes, um, and you can get it at literally at centimeter level over many, many kilometers. In this case, we measured 40 different dike segments. We got 40,000 aperture measurements at one centimeter intervals. There is no way you could do this using traditional approaches in the field. There's no way you could manually measure the dike apertures. People did in the past. They very painstaking 
field work over several years, they'd go out and they might collect 100 measurements on one guy. Uh, and that, this technology is transforming what we do. And what it's allowed us to see, one of the first insights in the, that's emerged from this data set, these are the, the bird's eye view of some of those dike segments. The dike walls are shown in white. If you, uh, the, I just, the, the length scale is in, in, in uh, tens of meters there, but the, the y-axis here is, you can see that's actually in, has been exaggerated, vertically exaggerated. Because what we're trying to show you is that there is some fine scale that detail in this, these dike walls that have never been observed before. There's a very interesting oscillation going on in the margins of these dike walls. And this is the first time we've been able to get this sort of insight. Those gray points are the uncertainties on the, the actual measurements from the field. So we can see that these oscillations are well beyond um, the uncertainties in the measurement method, method. So these are real. And this is giving us some insights into dike mechanics um, and intrusion mechanisms, which is sort of a bit of a, a world first. And some of the data is getting published in these locations now. All right. So the software we've written in Cloud Compare for extracting, for mapping out geological features and extracting orientations, that's using a technique known as a least cost path solver. It's still a manual technique. You have to click on one end of the feature and on the other, and then it will do the automatically linking for you. It speeds things up enormously, and it's very accurate. But the next step is obviously to begin to apply various types of machine learning to the data sets we get, or deep learning. Uh, this is a deep learning method. It's a convoluted neural network. This is very early days. Actually, we've got much better data sets than this now, but I, I can't show them to you yet. Um, what you see here is an image of uh, an outcrop from a, coast, a coastal outcrop. For those of you who are geologists in the, or are used to looking at rocks, you might detect this very slight different shades of grey emerging from these rocks. So what we've actually got is a, um, uh, what's called a tonalite in the middle, and a gabbro on the margins, and then there's a series of different types of dike cutting through the outcrop. And we applied to CNN, we, we trained the, the neural network up on a series of images, and then we applied it, began to apply it to other images, and got it to start to generate maps in real time. So this map here uh, was created in 82 seconds. And this, the processing times we, we're getting from other, other approaches now are three, two to three seconds. Um, the accuracy is okay, pixel accuracy. You can see that in this map, it's detecting where the vegetation is. It can distinguish that there is a, a rock type change between the center and the margins. And it's even picking out the fine differences between this dike and that dike. So it's, it's seeing some of the dikes. It's not what I would call a, a geology ready map yet, but it's getting, it's getting there close. It's getting there fairly quickly. And this work was done just by an honor student in, in 12 weeks. So, um, uh, the moment you put a postdoc on this sort of work in full time for a year or so, you know, this, this is cracked very, very quickly. I'm quite interested in, in these data sets on the right. These are called confidence maps, or they have different terms. Confidence maps are probability estimates of, from the code of what it thinks is present. And they actually seem to show us more information than what it eventually predicted. So you can see here, uh, it, the confidence map is picking out the outlines of the tone line more accurately than what it finally decided upon. And that's intriguing because what we, we did is we took this data set and we showed it to a bunch of geologists along with the images. We asked the geologists to make a geology map. And then we showed the same confidence maps to non-geologists who had never really picked up pen and pencil and tried to make a map uh, along with the photos, and we got them to do the same exercise. And the non-geologists generated the more, most accurate map. And the reason for that, I think, is because of um, cognitive bias. 
So as a geologist, you're trained, you know what you expect to see, you make quick decisions about what's in the photo, which aren't necessarily correct because they're influenced by, they're influenced by your biases. So this sort of opens up the possibility that you could put these data sets on the web and you could uh, crowdsource mapping, which is a technique that's being used in the biological sciences. People are using gamers at the moment to, um, to generate uh, new pharmaceutical products or solve protein structures with a sort of a similar approach. And we could be doing that in the earth sciences as well, just with big data sets we haven't got time to process ourselves. Uh, okay, so the, the obvious step, I've shown you miniaturization of sensors, I've shown you what we've been playing with in terms of um, and various analytical processes uh, to speeding up uh, extraction of information from the data. The next step is how do we do this at any location in the world without being hindered by uh, your compute power like your laptop and how do we speed it up? So at the moment the generation of a photogrammetric model once you've collected the images uh, can take several days, even a week or so, to generate a really big 3D model. Can we do that in real time? Is one question. And then can we actually begin to extract information from those photogrammetric models in an automatic way without having to be manually involved in the process um, at every step? And the, the way to the tackle that that we've, that we've settled on is obviously the cloud environment. So we've been building some cloud-based pipelines where you link together the different bits of software and the software itself is sat on high-performance computers so you can speed up the generation of the model and you, can, and you can automate some of the standard analysis approaches. And you know, this is a workflow. You, know, you might be as a geologist in the field collecting observations uh, alongside the flying of the drone, which is collecting the data sets. This then automatically uploads its data into the cloud environment where it's processed, generates a 3D model, it's interrogated through it with using some standard algorithms, which I might show you in a minute, I can't remember, and then it's analyzed. And you will need some kind of interaction through these steps, but at the same time, it's surprising when you break down the workflow of what we go through, it's often surprising how much of this repeats. So how much of this is a standard workflow which can be automated? And we want to get to a point where we can obviously make this um, speed that up so that eventually you might be in the field flying a drone and by the time the drone finishes you actually have your 3D model and you have some base products, some base maps which show you where there is an outcrop around the corner and what sort of orientations it's, it's predicting from that outcrop or what rock type is in that outcrop. Just as an example. Um, yes, so this is what the architecture of that cloud looks like in detail. You import your data into what we call a, a workbench environment. Basically, there's a, there's a computer at the front where you upload your data to, which then distributes the data to various other nodes and servers. And on those different nodes and servers, you have your, your um, the software that does the point cloud generation, the software that analyzes the, the point cloud products, and then you might export the results to various visualization environments. In this case, I mentioned previous. Some of you may have heard that. You can also map uh, and capture the, um, the, the, the decisions that are made every point, every step along that workflow, as well as the products, and you can publish them to environments such as Figshare. So that means that we, in doing this, we can actually have a, a fidelity of record that if anyone wants to use that data or check the quality of the data, they can actually go back and they can see at what point, um, what resolution of point cloud you were asking, what quality of point cloud you were asking for, what decisions you were making during the analysis stage in case they want to change that, for instance, just as one example. And this can be all, all automated, but more actually before I left, we were already at the point where we were linking those together and we were automatically publishing Figshare. This gets, in Figshare, I don't know if you know Figshare, there's, 
There's similar products like Fixshare and Invited out in the market. But what Fixshare is, it's a, it's, a, it's a location where you can put a model up or papers up, and each product you put there, it might be a table of data, it gets a DOI number. So it's searchable, it's officially published, and anyone can see it from around the world. All right, so we're coming towards the end now. Just give some <coughs> quick examples. Uh, one of the examples here is from Century Mine in Queensland. And uh, this is where we get to play some models. So, oh, it's working, that's good. So this environment you're seeing here is, is the cloud compare software I mentioned a few times. And you're seeing the western wall, part of the western wall of the Century Mine. If you zoom right in, you can see that that model is actually a point cloud. So it, it looks photorealistic. It's only when you get very, very close you can see the individual pixels. We created that point cloud, well, the photos we, we used to capture that point cloud, to create that point cloud, photos were captured in uh, about 15 minutes in one single flight. Once it's in Cloud Compare, you can do some very standard analysis. Here we're looking at um, different scale of views of the colors to begin with. And then we're going to look at orientation data in the point cloud. So, oh no, sorry, that's still a color, a color, different color view of the point cloud. So what this is, the point behind this is, this is enabling you to spot features in that point cloud that the RGB imagery uh, doesn't enable you to see very easily. So playing around with the, the, the colour scale field and the colour routes enables you to draw out extra features very quickly. Now I should say that what you're seeing here is in real time. So I've just all I've done here is created a video of me work, doing a workflow. So this is, um, as you can see, it's, it's very quick. And that data set's quite large. I think it's about... Um, could be a gigabyte of, of file size, I'm not quite sure. Right, now what you're seeing there is an image of orientation. So that's a map of, of strike orientation. And we can generate a similar map of dip orientation of the surfaces of, of the point of, of the rocks in this case. And you can see, you know, features like this. This is on the, the top wall you can actually see the wall collapsing and it's generating little normal faults, little normal fault scarps in a network in this area. So you've already had one major collapse there, but it, clearly the wall is about to fail um, just further to the north here. And no human being is allowed on that wall, even though some of the information that's contained in those rocks is actually quite valuable for our technical engineers to be able to predict the, um, the failure progression and timelines. Obviously, with a digital data set in three dimensions, you can collect as much information as you want, as though you were on the ground. And with the tool that we've developed, which is known as Compass, that's a little plugin, it comes automatically with the software, you can actually go in and you can begin to measure those orientations as though you were actually there in the field. And you can begin to measure the, the, the spacings and so on. And you can do it at high resolution. I'm just showing you here a very quick workflow that can extract out of those little faults um, automatically. Uh, you know. So within three minutes of this video playing, we've been able to isolate faults that are responsible for the collapse of the wall and, uh, and turn them into a useful data set. Okay. Yeah. This next data set is. Oh, how do I turn the sound off? Through lines here, and we construct it in the way. And um, there we go. That's my student sound talking. Um, so Santa guy has written this code. We've gone back to that the interior of that volcano, and you're seeing here um, the compass tool has been used to trace those ducts. And what you can see having gone through that workflow, is there's various populations of dike now. Yeah. <coughs> Sam's just proving to you that it's still a point cloud at this point. We can zoom in and out. Um, and then he's showing you here 
that from that data set, you've been able to extract orientation information and the thicknesses between the dike walls. And he's also been able to get a measurement of the confidence we have in those orientations. So we've we're using a Bayesian mathematical approach to quantify how certain we are that our orientations are correct. And then you can do things like plot the data up very, very rapidly in StereoNet. Once again, this is in real time. So what Sam's walking you through is, is real time. And there's one or two things he's done here which were pre-prepared. So in that StereoNet, you can see that there were a few different hotspots, meaning there were a few different populations of dike, which you can also see visually. And in this particular case, we were concerned about collapse. And we we're actually using this in a volcano, a volcanic environment, to understand volcano collapse and tsunami hazard. What we're trying to do is work out whether dike networks in a volcano um, are responsible for making, for strengthening the volcanic edifice. But the moment they begin to fail, the volcanic edifice can potentially reach a critical state where it just collapses catastrophically. So we're trying to understand that process, and that's what we're using this data for. So what Sam did is he took that information, the orientation information, and he began to look at different populations of dike and map out how they relate to the overall um, collapse scarp in, uh, in 2D and bird's eye view. And you could see that, that there was a particular population which is radial, meaning that, that, that they're all pointing back to the old volcanic center. So that red spot there is actually the old volcanic center where the eruptions came from. And then as the edifice grew, the volcano became stable and then collapsed away through the scar. Really interesting study. <coughs> we can stop there. All right. And the final example I want to show you is a bit of fun. Um, this is where we've, I've been working with robotics engineers, building drones that can fly on the ground, but applying the same workflow. Can we get those drones creating those 3D point cloud models in real time? and then extracting information from them. There's already a product on the market, or just emerged on the market from Emerson, the Hover, Hover Map, which was, I think Emerson the commercialization partner, but this was actually built by Syro. And they've done some trials in Barrick, and you can see here their drone is flying on the ground, I think. To be honest, they, they talk about it being automatic, I think, um, for this trial that they had a, a pilot actually driving it. I'm not sure about that. But this is actually a, a, a LiDAR approach. It's a laser scanning approach. We, we're using laser scanning and photogrammetry, which also returns um, the color information in real time. And we want to be able to get to the point, as I mentioned, where we can extract geology maps from a dry face and from within a stone, as well as information about infrastructure like ventilation and rock bolts <coughs> and whether they're degrading or, or, or even wall, wall movement. There's an example of one of our scans just from Rosebury Mine. That's just a simple 3D model uh, of the data that was returned by the, with the drone. And here's the drone flying in the ground um, autonomously. Not very interesting, but um, you can see that it'll go around a corner in a minute. I think, have you guys been involved in doing similar developments? I know CRC um, or, no, mining? mining? CRC mining? Yeah, um, I think mining three. Mining three, yeah. And, and also MQ, which used to be involved. Yeah, so. yeah. So I know that they've, they've got some similar things going on, yeah. Okay, so it gets to the end of the drive phase. It, it, taking images of that drive there, which is useful for the geologists. At the same time, it's been getting imagery from the rock bolts. And I think it just goes around the corner in a minute. But, but the essential instrument that we've built, off the shelf components, looks really crude, quite heavy. It's only flying for 10 minutes at the moment. That doesn't matter. What we're doing here that's slightly different to the current products is we're not only using the photogrammetry and the LiDAR to help position the drone, We've actually built in fluid mechanics into the onboard processing. Because what happens is if that drone happen, uh, unfortunately gets close to, say, a, a moving vehicle or a, an unexpected object, the turbulence 
around the rotor blades causes the drone to attract itself to the wall or the ceiling. So we built in some fluid mechanics codes to begin to counteract that behavior. And the code is actually able to sense the um, changes in the, in the pressure, the air pressures that are, that are affecting each blade, and then, then um, react accordingly, you know, fairly instantaneously. Here's, here's the instrument in, um, in a test site, just in a, a, a container. And what the student's doing here is he's, gonna, he's deliberately pushing it towards the wall, and then you can see that it, it quickly migrates back to the center of, of, the, of the room. And we're hoping, you know, this is, this is just showing you the workflow in terms of getting that thing working in terms of auto navigating in a confined space and doing so in a way that doesn't rely on external sensors or, or GPS. But the beauty of it is you can program in things like built-in flight patterns. So you could, you know, you could make it fly. When it gets to a dry face, you can tell it, we want you to fly in a grid pattern around this dry face and avoid the walls and the sides, or go up and down the stope in a particular way so you can collect the right, so you, you don't miss anything when you're creating a 3D model, as an example. Oh. And here is an example of us creating 3D models in real time. So photogrammetry at the moment uses a process known as um, uh, SFM, structural motion. That's the technique we've been using. That's the one that's most commonly available on the market. But there are other techniques out there that the computer vision scientists have built. One of them is known as SLAM, which is simultaneous localization mapping. And what you're seeing is this, as this drone is flying down the tunnel, it's picking, the SLAM algorithm is picking out the key points as it goes and generating a, a, a crude outline to the tunnel. You can see the key points being identified in the video as, as, it, as the drone flies. And then the drone is descending down a stope, which is why there's a bit of water there, and it's mapping the stoke walls. And eventually it'll come back up and go back. And we were able to create that 3D model from point key points, and we were also able to extract geology from this image. Um, at the moment, we're at a stage where the SLAM model is only a sparse cloud. So this isn't the photorealistic clouds that we were talking about earlier. So in order to extract the geology, we still had to use the, the old method, the uh, the uh, SFM method to get a photorealistic image of the of the stoke. But the guys who I was interacting with on this are confident that they can create a dense cloud <coughs> in, in, you know, with just a bit of work. In fact, these guys are from the Center for Excellence for Robotic Vision, which I believe QUT is actually the headquarters of. So the professor I was working with, collaborating with on this work, collaborates with you guys already. And that, I think, oh no, not quite it, it's earlier. These are examples of the same date from underground, that's Fosterville Mine. And here you can see a tunnel where we've, we've flown the drone and, and then we've, we've got the, we're actually beginning to detect whether the, the, the tunnel walls are collapsing or, or moving in any way, which is the, the, the red spots and the blue spots. And then finally, the other data set is we want to apply that deep learning to these data sets. So I've already talked to you about trying to extract a geology map from the imagery as it's going. And here's an example of that. So um, this is a snapshot from underground in Fosterville gold mine. Very complicated quartz veins against um, uh, meta sediments, as well as shock creeks and rock bolts. And, um, this actually here is, uh, is the training image, and then this is its predicted image. So the geology side of things, again, we're still working on it. That's going to be a bit of work in progress, but it's not too bad. It's, the blue represents zones of quartz vein density, and it's certainly highlighting where it thinks there's higher vein density relative to the rock around it. But what was quite encouraging was how accurate it is in identifying the rock bolts. And so, you, know, you can quickly begin to map out infrastructure and then compare it to your previous data set and work out whether it's degrading or moving or anything like that. 
So that's where we're up to. Question is, our drone is going to be the light at the end of the tunnel for some of our problems. And uh, yeah, anyone, and I'll throw open the questions to you now. So thank you for having me.